rights organization, Amnesty International. Amnesty is a worldwide movement of 11 million people who fight for human rights uh, and expose and work to end human rights abuses worldwide. And I'm really excited to be joining you today for this webinar, uh, co-hosted by my colleague, Andrew Fandino from Amnesty International USA, uh, to hear from the one and only Stephen Donziger. And Amnesty has been working on the case of Stephen Donziger for many, many years now, but his situation has significantly escalated in the last few months and honestly within even the last few days. And so today we're going to have an opportunity to hear from Stephen himself. Um, first, I'd like to hand it over to Andrew, if you want to introduce yourself real quick, and then I'll say a few more words and I'll hand it over to Stephen. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my name is Andrew Fandino. I'm the senior program officer with the Individuals at Risk program at Amnesty International USA. So I cover everything having to do with human rights defenders and prisoners of conscience. And Stephen, it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us today. It's an honor and, and privilege. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so Stephen Donziger is an environmental lawyer, a human rights defender, a hero to many folks. And yesterday was a significant day, not just because it was Valentine's Day, but because it marked 11 years since Stephen helped lead a landmark lawsuit against the big oil company Chevron, uh, earning, winning a $9.5 billion settlement for the indigenous communities of Ecuador, um, whose land Chevron was spilling oil on. And so yesterday was a huge anniversary um, for Stephen and for the people of Ecuador uh, who this lawsuit was on behalf of. But in the last 11 years, Stephen Donziger has been through legal hell and back. Chevron has gone to every length to retaliate against him, and Stephen has spent over 900 days on house arrest for trumped up charges of contempt of court, and he even did 45 days in jail. This is just the tip of the iceberg, uh, and I want to give Stephen a chance to tell us more about his journey, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm just here to say that Amnesty International is, is honored and pleased to support Stephen uh, during his struggle. Uh, we are... Uh, we are very appreciative of all you, that you have done for human rights, Stephen. Uh, we are proud to be standing alongside of you while you were fighting back against this apparent retaliation, which we as Amnesty International are not only appalled by, but the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention has also spoken out about. So Stephen, I'd like to hand it over to you uh, just to tell us about yourself, and then we're going to make this into a conversation. So Andrew is going to pitch some questions to you, and I'd like to invite the participants to drop their questions in the Q&A section so we can ask you those as well. So Stephen, please take it away. Wow, thank you. That was quite the introduction. And I, I want to write back at you, Ali and Andrew and everyone on your team for your work to help me and my family. It's been just critically important to, I believe, my survival. Um, and also just to all the people in Amnesty for the great work you've done since your founding, you know, decades ago and all the people around the world who've been helped by, you know, by the voice and scrutiny you give to people who are in trouble, who are political prisoners and the like. You know, my case is sort of unusual. Uh, and I'm going to give like, I'm going to try to give like a five, seven minute little background. And then I really want to open it up. But I think my case is unusual in that it's very rare for either Amnesty or the United Nations Working Group to condemn the treatment of a detainee or a prisoner in the United States. And we all know our criminal justice system and our justice system more broadly has a tremendous amount of problems in this country. You know, from, rape, from police racism to all sorts of structural inequities. I observed this myself as, for many years as a, def as a criminal defense lawyer. I used to be a public defender in Washington, D.C. in the early part of my career. You know, and I want to acknowledge that my situation is, while different, is not really that dissimilar to that experience by many, many, many people, you know, through in our criminal justice system and through our history. In many respects, those situations are worse than mine. So I wanna just put that out there. Now, what is crazy about my situation is for years, I worked with a team of lawyers in Ecuador to help indigenous peoples and farmer communities win a multi-billion dollar pollution judgment against Chevron after Chevron admitted to deliberately dumping billions of gallons of cancer causing oil waste onto ancestral lands that led to massive cancers, huge number of deaths, tremendous amount of suffering, and essentially the poisoning of a 1500 square mile area of rainforest where you could not get clean water um, for peoples who've lived there for millennia who never 
had money or needed money to buy bottled water. So there was this mass industrial poisoning that took place down in this northern part of Ecuador's Amazon in the 1970s and 1980s and early 90s. Chevron was actually Texaco. Chevron later bought Texaco. They fled the country in the early 90s, left behind this mass toxic waste, a thousand open air waste pits, pipes running into rivers and streams. Um, and the problem is still there. Um, it's still polluting, it's still causing harm, even though they left 30 years ago. And it's probably the worst oil related problem in, in the world. And it's made even worse by the fact that they did it deliberately to save money. It was not an accident like say the BP spill in the Gulf of Mexico, the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010. In any event, I was part of a team as a young lawyer that sued Texaco, then Chevron in US courts. They wanted the case in Ecuador, they accepted jurisdiction there. They forced us to go back and litigate the case in Ecuador. We had a great team of Ecuadorian lawyers with whom we worked with. Um, led by Pablo Fajardo and Julio Prieto, Juan Pablo Sanz and others. Um, and ultimately that team over an eight year trial that ended in 2011 won a, a, you know, a very significant pollution judgment. It was affirmed on appeal, but reduced ultimately to about $9 billion. While that might seem like a lot, by the way, you know, BP has paid around $70 billion for the Deepwater Horizon spill, which was an accident. Um, Chevron has yet to pay a dollar to the people at Poison in Ecuador and instead has unleashed dozens and dozens of law firms and about 2000 lawyers to attack me and try to make me the poster boy of what human rights lawyers should not do. And this, what's happened to me, and it goes well beyond me because it really is, in my opinion, a wholesale attack on the idea of human rights lawyering and a wholesale attack on the idea of environmental defense work. Um, you know, they sued me for $60 billion. They denied me a jury. They got a tobacco industry judge, Lewis Kaplan, to find me guilty in a non-jury trial, civil trial, um, of all sorts of crimes. Um, including bribing a judge in Ecuador, which is completely false. That evidence for that, by the way, comes from a man that Chevron paid $2 million to, an Ecuadorian man who came up here and he was coached for 53 days by Chevron's lawyers at the Gibson Dunn firm. Prior to taking the stand, he later recanted most of his testimony, it has zero credibility. And the underlying case, even with this man's so-called BS story, has been affirmed by six different appellate courts and 28 appellate judges. Um, but Chevron has used this testimony in New York where I live to try to essentially disrupt my advocacy and destroy my life. And one of the things they did is they got a Judge Kaplan to impose millions of dollars of court costs on me to pay their legal fees. You know, they have, they have hundreds of lawyers working on this. I'm a human rights lawyer. And this is the kind of tactic you often see in, in what people call lawfare. And might see this in Russia, China, other places, not in the United States though, where you kind of use economic tools to try to bankrupt advocates. And I was hit with mi literally millions of dollars of fines. I didn't have the money to pay. Chevron's lawyers then went back to Kaplan, demanded my computer on the theory that I was hiding money somewhere and they needed to see my computer, but they wanted to look at everything on my computer, including privileged information and, you know, communications with my clients and other lawyers. Um, I appealed that order, it was a civil discovery order in a civil case. And while it was on appeal for the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York, Judge Kaplan charged me with criminal contempt of court for appealing a civil discovery order, which literally hundreds and thousands of lawyers through our history have done. No one's ever been charged with criminal contempt of court. This is pure political retaliation um, by a judge who was really working hand in glove with the Chevron lawyers at Gibson Dunn to blow up the case and do it by destroying me. Um, he then took his charges. These were criminal contempt of court charges to the US attorney in New York that office refused to prosecute me, appropriately refused to prosecute me. Judge Kaplan then appointed a private law firm to prosecute me. Odd, isn't it? Like you don't see this. And the law, he then, 
hid the fact that the law firm he appointed, Seward and Kissel, based in Manhattan, um, had Chevron as a client and had very close ties to all sorts of oil and gas companies. And we found this out seven months later. It's a total conflict of interest. Um, the case still went forward because he appointed Loretta Presca, his close colleague, who's a leader of the Chevron funded Federalist Society to preside over my contempt case. And she proceeded to lock me up at home on August 6, 2019. I am the only lawyer in American history ever detained pre-trial on a, what is a misdemeanor charge um, for even a day. And for various reasons, many having to do with delays because of the COVID epidemic, pandemic, um, my trial did not happen until over two years later. And that entire time she kept me with an ankle bracelet locked up in my house, my apartment in Manhattan where I am today. Ultimately, we had a trial. She also denied me a jury and refused to let me testify as to my core defense. And there were all sorts of other irregularities in the trial, which has been condemned by the working group on arbitrary detention at the United Nations, as well as an independent trial monitor report headed by Ambassador Stephen Rapp, who's an esteemed uh, war crimes prosecutor, American man, who, who was an ambassador in the Obama administration, among others. Um, the trial was a farce that violated due process. And in the end of the day, Judge Prescott sentenced me to the maximum term of six months in prison after I'd already served over five times that amount, which is at home. Um, and, you know, the, the working group decided or determined this was, this violated multiple provisions of international law. In any event, I had to report to prison which I did on October 27th of last year. And Amnesty International put out an urgent action bulletin, which was, you know, helped me so much in terms of protecting me while in prison. Ultimately, for various legitimate policy reasons, because of COVID and my age, I was released after serving 25% of my sentence to serve the rest of my sentence in home. Um, and I came back on December 9th, and then just last week, just in this bizarre turn of events, the prison authorities called me and ordered me to report to a halfway house in the Bronx where they locked me up for another five days, wouldn't let me out, the windows wouldn't open. I never got a clear explanation as to what happened. Um, and because of the pressure, I think largely generated by amnesty, um, I was released back home yesterday after a truly Kafka-esque five days. Um, and here I am. My sentence ends April 25th. I have to stay at home the whole time. By the time I get out, I will have been locked up for 993 days, almost a thousand days on a misdemeanor where the maximum sentence under U.S. law is 180 days. This is so wrong. And it is such an attack on the rule of law. And I'll point out that this is the United States of America like you usually don't see this here. Um, you shouldn't see it anywhere. And we have to work together to make sure it never happens again to anybody because make no mistake, this is part of a corporate playbook. I was prosecuted privately by Chevron. Remember that, Chevron law firm, after the US attorney refused to prosecute me. It is a corporate playbook to do private criminal prosecutions run by companies targeting activists, campaigners, lawyers and advocates who challenge them too successfully, which is what happened to me. Because I am, a, I believe our work was so successful, they literally had to abuse and manipulate the law to target me in a way that is completely illegal. My case, by the way, is on appeal right now. Um, it's been on appeal for two or three months after argument. I, I'm frankly kind of surprised the three judge panel, by the way, all my judges were appointed by Donald Trump, have not has not ruled yet. But this is illegal to have private corporate criminal prosecutions. And we can't let our country move any further in this direction. And I hope it never happens again. So that's the big picture. And maybe we can open it up for questions. I don't know if I limited that to seven minutes or not. It might've gone a little long. Thanks, Stephen. Um, well, it's a treacherous story, but it's great to hear from you from your home. We're very glad that you are home. Uh, and I would like to give a shout out to all the Amnesty International activists who have logged into this webinar. Um, all of your actions made a difference. All your letters to Stephen, he got them, he read them. 
Um, and you can keep sending letters. Um, this struggle is not over. Um, at Amnesty, we are extremely concerned that um, Stephen's deprivation of liberty is arbitrary, which is what the UN Working Group has been saying as well. Uh, and we're concerned about the objectivity and impartiality of the judge who has issued his pretrial uh, home confinement. Um, these are extremely serious concerns, uh, and it's a very dangerous and, and, and alarming precedent that it could set for other situations facing human rights defenders or lawyers or anyone else who speaks out against whether it's corporate abuse or any other abuse in the United States. So Stephen, thrilled to see you in your home. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Andrew, who has a few questions for you. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. And again, thank you for, for going over your hearing story. And it's just um, really amazing that the links that, uh, you know, that you have to endure this whole time. And so I just wanted to ask you a few questions on maybe you can explain um, this to, to the audience a little bit more of your conditions of, of house arrest, which I think for a lot is quite shocking that you were in uh, house arrest for so long. Um, just like, what was that like? Um, if, if you could just kind of walk us through that. Happy to. Thank you, Andrew, for all you've done. Let, let me just say this about house arrest. I want to be very clear before I describe what it was like, what it's been like, that the longest sentence ever imposed on a lawyer for my criminal contempt charge is 90 days of home confinement. Like people don't get locked up for this. And that lawyer, by the way, Bruce Cutler, received his sentence after he was convicted. I started to serve my sentence because I think the whole purpose of this was to punish me and intimidate me before I even had a trial. I was two years and two months in home confinement before I had a misdemeanor trial where the maximum penalty is six months in prison. I mean, it is incredible how they can do this and get and think they can get away with it. So what did I do? I mean, look, there's two ways this can go. They can go south or north you know and what i decided at the beginning and i got very determined to use my time at home to work to build solidarity and to connect with people and to use social media and other platforms we have for those of us who do this work to push this out as far and wide as possible and andrew what ended up happening is we, we pretty much built an extraordinary campaign. I mean, you know, I didn't really do social media before they locked me up. I probably had a thousand Twitter followers when they locked me up and I'm now over 150,000. And I decided that I needed to do that to survive. You know, I needed some way to communicate to people to get through this because they were crushing me. And, and the reason I think they almost felt enticed to try to crush me is because they assessed the landscape and they didn't think I had leverage support that would force them to pay a price such that they would keep their hands off of me. So I spent a lot of time working, doing legal work for myself, talking to lawyers who were helping me building social media, socializing, and trying to keep alive. You know, it, it, it's, you know, as a very close friend of mine said, I was like six weeks into this. And she said, you know, you can either take antidepressants or you can build solidarity. Okay. If you build solidarity, you don't need pharmaceuticals. By the way, no disrespect to those who do pharmaceuticals. You know, I'm just saying, like, build solidarity. And it, it kind of allowed me to pass the time in a healthy way. Um, but it doesn't detract from the fact that it was just terrible. I mean, you know, to not be able to walk outside when you want, take your family to the beach, go on a vacation, go to dinner when you want. I mean, it's just an extremely fraught kind of existence. Um, you know, it is home, but it is prison at home. Make no mistake. Um, it's been brutal. I mean, it's been almost three years, man. And I'm like, they took that from me and my family. I have a 15 year old son. So he's been living with this since he was 12. Um, and my wife, Laura, you know, 
I mean, it's, it's tough, but you know, I want to acknowledge again, there are people out there having a lot tougher all over the world, but still, I, I just, I don't want to downplay the fact that it's tough and it's still tough. And the fact I have to sit here another two and a half months, ridiculous, ridiculous. So, you know, that's why we're calling on people to pressure Merrick Garland to take back this private Chevron prosecution and release me now. This is ridiculous. Anyway, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much, Stephen. And, and, and I think the, the, we were all shocked when the judgment came in and that you actually had to serve time in prison. Um, I mean, that for all of us, I think that was something that we were, you know, we knew that was kind of where the trajectory is going, unfortunately. Um, but still, that, that it went to that extreme and, uh, you know, hearing the proceedings and everything, a lot of our staff were quite shocked at the, the, the language that was used <laughs> in the right. courtroom. Um, and um, so you ended up having to, if you could maybe retell um, the audience, um, uh, the amount of time that you spent in prison um, and how those, how that experience was. Because not only, you know, if the house arrest for such an extended period, but then you actually having to serve prison time as well. Yeah, so I was, you know, it's just such a crazy thing what happened. So basically, Judge Preska, who was the Federalist Society judge appointed by Judge Kaplan, who was had locked me up and was clearly targeting me and I think conducting herself entirely inappropriately. I mean, I, look, I respect judges. I respect the judiciary. This was really uncool. I mean, she was basically violating her ethical duty to be neutral, to make me suffer as much as possible because no one locks anyone up pretrial on a misdemeanor in this country. I'm the only one, only lawyer, I should say. So already I had an issue there. And after she sentenced me, I appealed her order that I go report to prison immediately. I wanted to stay out pending my appeal because I mean, again, it's totally normal to stay out pending an appeal on a misdemeanor. It's crazy. And she ordered me right into prison, but she did let me stay out to appeal her order that I go into prison immediately, like this limited appeal, which took about a month to resolve. A week later, while that mini appeal was pending, she issued this bizarre order saying, if you lose that appeal, you must report within 24 hours to the US Marshals at the federal courthouse in Manhattan. And I'm like, uh-uh. Like her goal was to force me into the MDC, which is one of the worst jails in America in Brooklyn. Because if you report, the Manhattan jail, by the way, has been closed for renovation. That's where Jeffrey Epstein was, where he, he got killed or died or whatever, committed suicide, whatever happened. So anyone in Manhattan now goes to the Brooklyn jail, which is famous for its awful conditions. You can't go outside, it's overcrowded, fested with COVID. And like, I'm like, I actually believe she was trying to get me killed. I mean, I, I like, why would you treat a lawyer in that way? Like, why not just let the Bureau of Prisons designate him to a camp or a normal prison and let him report to that prison. Why is she ordering me within 24 hours to just go? And luckily the Bureau of Prisons in the meantime designated me to the Danbury prison in Connecticut, which is a low security prison. And when I lost my appeal, I had 24 hours because of Judge Preska's order to report to the Bureau of Prisons custody. I was like, you know, do you go to the Brooklyn place? Do you go to Danbury? Anyway, I drove myself to prison. And by the way, the whole justification supposedly for I was at home for two years was I was a risk of flight. I ended up driving myself to prison and I had to do it within 24 hours because once that order came down, like there was no chance to just plan and boom, I'm in prison. It was crazy, you know, that it happened that way. It didn't have to, but she forced it. And again, I think to destabilize me and my family. Look, once in prison, man. And look, I'm not going to say, you know, there's tough prisons, man, in America. This was not known as a terribly tough prison, but it was tough. Um, there was for the most of the time I was there, we were under lockdown because of COVID, couldn't go outside. Um, there were 
guys in there doing long sentences for some pretty serious stuff, which is not to disrespect them because everyone I met was nice and kind and decent and many had been rehabilitated and then some and shouldn't have been in, in my opinion. Um, the people I met were lovely and full of life and humanity and they were doing genius things to maintain their autonomy in the face of a real system that was designed to brutalize. Um, I found the experience on one level just incredibly tough. I lost a lot of weight. There's very little food, no nutrition, um, lockdown. On another level, I found it unbelievably enhancing and humanizing and, you know, just to see it to meet the people and to experience that humanity, just teeming with humanity, um, with people who refuse to give in. It's not that they're openly rebelling. It's just that they just don't give in. They maintain their spirit, you know, and that's what I did. I mean, I was only there 45 days. Honestly, it felt like an eternity. I mean, I'm the day before I left, I met a guy I'd been there 41 years. I was there 45 days. They would like laugh at me. But to me, it felt like forever. You know, I took a, I took a pretty detailed journal when I was in there. I, I hope to do something with it. I mean, I was writing. Great. Thank you, Stephen, so much. Um, I, I, at the beginning, you had actually mentioned um, that uh, unfortunately the contamination continues in, in Ecuador. And I know uh, more recently there was a, another um, oil spill, obviously nowhere near the, um, uh, the, the catastrophe that happened um, uh, before. But I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit of what's going on there continuously. What are the indigenous populations, what are they facing? Um, I, I know you worked very closely with a lot of the communities there, environmental human rights defenders. What is the situation like for them and, and the community right now? What are they facing still? Thank you. I mean, you know, I think that's where the focus needs to be, by the way. I mean, I, I Chevron just wants this to be all about me, and it really isn't. I mean, what's happening to me is important, but what's happening in Ecuador is, in my opinion, more important. Let me just say this. The spill that people saw videos of recently was an accident, horrendous, caused massive damage. I posted a video on my Twitter, at Estanzier, it got almost a million views, okay? It is terrible. But you know, the crazy thing is what Chevron did was different. I mean, that spill was accidental because of negligence. What Chevron did is they actually engineered a design to dump cancer-causing oil waste billions of gallons of it. Most of it had benzene in it and other heavy metals and other, you know, chromium six and other man-made synthetic cancer causing chemicals used in the oil drilling process. And they, they designed the system to just put it in the water supply. I mean, it's criminal, it's criminal, it's ecocide. A lot of people are watching the development of this new atrocity crime called ecocide. This is the very definition of ecocide like the deliberate destruction of the natural environment with the clearly foreseeable effect that people would die. And that is exactly what's happened. And, you know, I've been there over 250 times from New York where I live. There's over a 20 year period. I was going down once a month for the most part to help the legal team and to just, you know, I was very involved. Um, and the more I went, the more, and I'd travel around, the more I'd see the suffering, the deaths, people I knew started to pass away from cancer. There's very little medical care. Um, there's the, the problem as Chevron left it when they left Ecuador in 1992 is there, but it's, it's gotten worse. It's just sitting out there. I mean, thousand open air toxic waste pits, most with pipes running into nearby streams and rivers that people rely on for their drinking water. So it has really decimated indigenous peoples, you know, the five indigenous nations that are in this area. Now, they are really determined and strong peoples and they have survived, but it's not what it used to be, not even close. The struggles they have to maintain their traditional culture and lifestyle are immense. 
Most have been forced off the land into nearby cities to take wage paying jobs. You know, they never needed money as we know it before. Um, and by the way, you know, one thing I learned in Ecuador, and I've learned so much, by the way, from the people of Ecuador with whom I work, they've, I've learned so much more from them than they could ever learn from me. I'm just telling you that. One thing I learned is, you know, you don't need money to be rich. Think about that. And I spoke to my son's class a few years ago. I'm like, I'm like, can you figure out how you can be rich and not have money? And like, the students like, no one could compute that concept in like our Western consumerist society. But these people were rich. They had everything. They had food, water, you know, materials to build shelter, fish, animals, culture, happiness. And it has been completely, completely, I don't want to say destroyed because it, it exists, but it's a, it's, a, it's a shadow of what it used to be. Even when I started going down there in the early 90s, it's just really been bad. And like the idea that Chevron did this deliberately has literally destroyed cultures or I should say decimated cultures um, and has not done anything about it. I mean, how does this company have a social license to operate anywhere, anywhere? And by the way, They've done similar things in other countries. I'm just telling you. I mean, there's a whole report by Dr. Nan Greer that is mind blowing about the billions and billions and billions of dollars of environmental liabilities that Chevron has all over the world. And of course, other fossil fuel majors have the same problem, like Exxon. Um, but it is just mind blowing that, you know, the people of Ecuador actually went to court, won the case, affirmed on appeal, and they still haven't paid. You know, and they wanted the trial in Ecuador, they accepted jurisdiction there still won't pay, you know? And they literally spent a, a couple of billion dollars to go after me. I mean, you know, excuse me, not a million, not 10 million. I'm talking, not 1 billion, two, $3 billion. I mean, they've used 60 law firms. Some of the top law firms in America, corporate law firms in America. And I work out of my apartment. Man, it's, it's really, backwards. You know, if they had just used that money to settle the case, I'd be fine. People of Ecuador would be in much better shape. And frankly, Chevron's reputation would be better. Well, thanks, Stephen. I'd like to echo our solidarity with the people of Ecuador who are surviving any kind of corporate greed. Um, the human rights defenders in Ecuador and beyond in Latin America who have been speaking out against um, human rights violations by states and by corporations against them. And thank you for sharing that story with us. Um, I also would like to mention uh, that as a part of trying to free Steve Donziger, Stephen Donziger, um, we are at Amnesty International and Stephen's worldwide support network are calling on the US Department of Justice to assume jurisdiction over the case. We want the Attorney General Merrick Garland to take the case. And we have been calling and emailing and showing up at the DOJ uh, to tell them that it is imperative that they do this. So we're continuing that call. Um, so far, they haven't responded to us, but they can't ignore us forever, especially if our voices get louder and we keep up the momentum and we escalate. Um, so I, we're, I'll be dropping some links in the chat uh, sample language that you can send to the DOJ, email addresses you can send it to. Uh, and in the meantime, many thanks to the attendees who have been uh, putting a lot of support and love for Stephen in the chat and a lot of questions. So I'm going to field a few of the questions for you, Stephen, um, okay. from folks in the audience. Um, first of all, someone is asking, what is the deal with this private prosecutor? How, how, why <laughs> is this common? Uh, can you tell us more about that, uh, about what's happening with that? This is the most frightening feature of what's happened to me, or one of them, um, because without a private prosecutor, there'd be no criminal case and I never would have gotten locked up. Because remember, the public prosecutor refused to prosecute me based on charges created by Judge Kaplan, and I would say bogus charges, because what I did was not criminal. It was, let me explain what I did so people really understand this. You know, this is a, I assume a pretty sophisticated audience used to sort of understanding 
abuses of power. This is what happened. They, went, they wanted my, Chevron wanted my computer and my cell phone to look at all my electronic information, including privileged information protected by law. I had an ethical duty to protect the privileged information, which by the way, that privilege is held by the people of Ecuador, my clients, not by me. That was my duty. I could have been disbarred by just giving Chevron that information. So Judge Kaplan and Chevron deliberately put me in an impossible position where I had to choose between complying with what I thought was his illegal court order to turn over to Chevron my computer or complying with the ethical obligations I had to the people, my clients who were dying in Ecuador and whose lives would have been put in danger had Chevron gotten this privileged information. So I never said, oh, I'm going to never comply with your order. I did what responsible people in my position do, which is I appealed it. He then charged me with criminal contempt of court while my appeal of his, I thought his unlawful order was pending. That has never happened before in US history. This is a civil case, it's not a criminal case. Never happened before. And the abuse is like manipulating that civil case and his charges to get me locked up. And this is where the private prosecutor comes in. The public prosecutor refused the case. So he appoints a private law firm to prosecute me. I'm sorry, judges respectfully should not be allowed to appoint private law firms to prosecute people when the law firms have clients that the targeted lawyer won civil judgments against. He let Chevron prosecute me because he couldn't get anyone else to do it normally. Um, I think it's just blatantly unconstitutional and illegal. And so does the United Nations. And by the way, any country that respects the rule of law would not do this. Now, there's a little nuance I want people to be aware of. It is permissible under our federal rules of criminal procedure for a judge to appoint a private law firm to do a prosecution under extremely rare circumstances. For example, when a office, they need a case needs to go and for someone in the office, a small prosecutor's office might have a conflict of interest. But in those rare, rare, rare times that happens, the, the prosecutors appointed are disinterested. They're not conflicted. They don't have a stake in the outcome. There's a thousand former federal prosecutors around the New York area. He could have appointed any one of them. That wasn't the point. He appointed a Chevron prosecutor thinking he could get away with it, thinking we wouldn't find out. So that was all part of the plan to abuse the system, to lock me up illegally, because I never would have been locked up. Actually, the case never would have been prosecuted, as we now know, had a normal federal prosecutor been assigned to the case, because they were asked and they refused. And by the way, this is what just really upsets me about the Biden administration and Attorney General Garland. And Attorney General Garland, come on. I mean, you have a private corporate prosecution in your country acting in the name of the Justice Department. Stop this. Look at, I mean, do you think this is just happening? I'm like, I'm in prison for 900 plus days for a misdemeanor because it's just like normal. It's happening because there's a private corporate prosecutor who's violating the law. So it really is important that we continue to pressure Merrick Garland to take back this case. Why don't you do it, sir? Okay, this is an embarrassment for our country and for your department. And I'm calling on you again to take over this private Chevron prosecution that is illegal, bring it under the auspices of the Department of Justice, you know, I laugh. I'm probably the only lawyer in U.S. history begging the Department of Justice to prosecute me. Please prosecute me. This is not a normal prosecution. Please review this case and, and bring it into compliance with the rule of law. I hope that explains that. that no, issue. that explains it perfectly, Stephen. And it's incredibly important to point out that while this situation is about you, it's also about anyone. Your case yes. is an emblematic example 
uh, of an extremely alarming trend that we're seeing around the entire world, not just in the US, but around the entire world of corporations weaponizing the justice system to both target and harass human rights defenders. And what we're seeing as a part of this trend is shrinking civic space. So the US government and Merrick Garland in particular should pay close attention and remedy this, your case, because if not, the U.S. government is sending a message to the rest of the world and governments worldwide um, and corporations that that this is OK and that they can get away with it. And so what's happening to you uh, is, like I said, an emblematic example. And that's why it's imperative that activists worldwide stand in solidarity with you and take action and call on Merrick Garland to take your case. Um, we've had a few questions in the chat from folks who are, they want to know about your situation as a lawyer. Um, you were disbarred uh, as a part of this process. What does that look like for you moving forward? Um, and it, yeah, there's many, multiple people have asked about it. So if you could speak on that, that would be terrific. Yeah. So, you know, this is sort of a lot to absorb, but the attacks on me have been multi-pronged. Okay. So, you know, they took my money with these million dollar court costs. They um, locked me up. They tried to destroy my reputation. And they also took my law license without a hearing. Um, and I recently posted on my Twitter a, a thread about this that I urge people to read. It's pretty detailed how clever the manipulation of this aspect of the attack was. But essentially what happened is when Judge Kaplan found that I bribed a judge in Ecuador based on this false witness testimony paid by Chevron, he and his colleagues then wrote a letter to the Bar Grievance Committee in Manhattan saying you must disbar this person based on a theory of collateral estoppel, which essentially means you can't let him challenge my finding in this civil case without a jury. That's the finding. He bribed a judge and therefore he should be disbarred. Now, if a lawyer bribes a judge, I sort of agree he or she probably should be disbarred unless there's some extremely extenuating kind of circumstance, but that didn't happen. And the way he tried to engineer Kaplan and Chevron, my disbarment is they just wouldn't give me a hearing. And I challenged it every step of the way and they suspended my law license calling me a threat to the public interest. Can you imagine that? I fought 28 years for environmental rights and I'm a threat to the public interest for winning, essentially is how they, what they determined. So I never got a hearing to challenge his evidence and they disbarred me. You know, I appealed it. The Court of Appeals here in New York refused to take my appeal. I then had a hearing, I insisted on a hearing, which I got and the hearing officer, John Horan, respected former federal prosecutor, would only because of this rule, let me present character evidence. Like people come in and say, I'm a good guy and man of integrity. And, and many, many people came in, including Simon Taylor from Global Witness and John Kecker, um, prominent US trial lawyer. I mean, so many prominent people came in who had worked with me, um, lawyers and others, Paul Posse Mino from Amazon Watch, that Horan, the, the hearing officer, wrote a 45 page decision and recommended my immediate reinstatement as a lawyer. And the grievance committee, which was completely under the thumb of the Chevron lawyers who were like watching my hearing and texting them and giving them materials to submit, doing their work for them basically, um, they appealed it. And the court of appeals in a conclusory one page decision refused to accept the 45 page recommendation of John Horan. Um, and I've since appealed to the US Supreme Court because I think it's a damn outrage that anyone can be disbarred based on a civil finding of fraud without a jury and without a hearing. It's not how due process works. So it's just another aspect of the violation of my rights, which is really an attack obviously on the people of Ecuador. I do wanna say I'm a member of the DC bar. Um, my disbarment was in New York. And to the credit of the DC bar, they have not imposed what they call reciprocal discipline because I think they recognize there's a real problem here. So I hope to get my law license back. I really do. But you know, not having my law license is not stopping me from being the advocate that I am. And I promise you, I will continue to advocate.
Thanks, Stephen. And I'd just like to do a pitch for your website, freedonziger.com. That is the mothership of Stephen's campaign where you can find all the information that you need. So I encourage you to check it out if you haven't already. Uh, Stephen, a few folks have said, you know, with Merrick Garland um, stonewalling us, which members of Congress have actually had the guts to step up and speak out for you? Are there any folks that you'd like to, to give a shout out to while we've got you here? Sure. I mean, there's been 11 members of Congress who have spoken out, plus two senators. And I want to laud them, all of them. I mean, led, first of all, by Jim McGovern, chair of the House Rules Committee, who is still the only member of Congress ever to have visited Chevron's Cancer Zone in Ecuador. He came with me in 2008. And Jim, you've done great work your whole career for hunger and so many important human rights issues, man. Thank you. And I will say when I was just detained in isolation in this Kafka-esque experience that I emerged from yesterday in Bronx, you know, Jim was heavily involved in making sure, I, along with you, Ali, that I returned home safely. You know, and also AOC and Corey Bush and Rashida Tlaib, Jamal Bowman, um, Shue Garcia from Chicago, uh, Jamie Raskin signed a letter. Um, I'm probably forgetting some names. I can't remember them all. Also, Senator Markey and Senator Whitehouse have spoken out. Let me just say this, though. You know, where is our Congress? Come on. You know, 11 of 535 people. There's a massive human rights violation taking place on U.S. soil. I really need more support from electeds. Um, and we're pushing for it. But of course, we're deeply appreciative for those who have spoken out and taken leadership to do so. Well, that's a great call to action while we're applying pressure to Merrick Garland, the Attorney General. Um, folks, while they're at it, feeling motivated and angry after this webinar should call their members of Congress. And, and you know what? I would ask AOC, who I have deep affection for, although we've never met. You know, she's in New York. Hey, come visit me you know, and bring attention to this. Um, come visit me. It will be extremely helpful to me and the people of Ecuador to human rights generally. And I, I want to say one thing. I mean, those are the people who help. There's a couple of others who really hurt me. And I just want to mention one, which is Jerry Nadler, who is my representative, who has refused to take my phone calls, respond to my emails, or obviously visit me. Um, and I just can't believe it. And I later found out that Jerry's received significant donations from Chevron's Gibson Dunn Law Firm. And his son is a lawyer in the Chevron Law Firm that's been attacking me for 10 years. Conflict of interest. It doesn't mean he can't love his son and also come visit me. <laughs> and he should. But Jerry Nadler really hurt us because so many members of Congress are like, well, what about your own representative? And they assume if your own representative won't speak out, then maybe there's something wrong with my story, you know? So I'm critical of Jerry Nadler, and I think he needs to step up and come see me as well. Thanks, Stephen. Um, we're so appreciative for your time. I've got a couple more questions I'd like to pitch to you uh, from the audience. And one is from an individual who says, what can lawyers, law students, and members of the bar in the US, Canada, and other jurisdictions do to ensure this attack on the integrity of our legal system from the corporate sector stop, is stopped from taking root? There needs to be more organizing and activism among lawyers. And you know, I don't think this is like a, a progressive versus conservative issue or a left-right issue. I mean, no lawyer, should ever be have his law his or her law license taken away without a hearing. I mean, what is so problematic with that? You know, so I'm a little disappointed, frankly, that the official bar associations around New York City and New York State have not come to my defense. I mean, I've seen a massive amount of silence and sideline sitting by them. And I've gotten much more support from lawyers around the world and other states. 37 bar associations have backed me, including bar associations in Italy, Spain, France, Ireland. I mean, it's just amazing the support. But like in my own hometown, not a single bar association has spoken out about this complete violation of the rule of law, this abomination. And again, you don't have to agree with me. You don't have to like me. 
but let's stand for a principle, you know? And I will say like a lot of con more conservative lawyers in the corporate sector have told me privately how outraged they are by my treatment. But, you know, people need to speak out and I'm hoping these bar associations speak out. You know, it's just so important that institutionally as professionals, we stand by each other, regardless of our personal politics. We need to stand for principles that no lawyer should have his or her license ever taken away without a hearing um, in a case where the finding is based on a civil finding with no jury. I mean, that's just crazy. So I'm hoping to ultimately get my license back. But in the meantime, I'm not going to shy away from sort of pointing out what actually happened. You know, I'm not ashamed I lost my license under these circumstances. I, I get what's happened here. This was a corporate attack where Chevron basically put the bar grievance committee under their power. You know, and, and by the way, there's academic research, if you look this up throughout our history, where lawyers who challenge entrenched interests, you know, be it government or corporate power, often get disbarred for the flimsiest of bogus reasons. You know, and you saw this a lot during the Red Scare, lawyers who would defend so-called communists often were disbarred, you know, or lawyers who would defend labor unions in the 1930s. I mean, there was all, this has always happened in our history. And now it's gonna be happening if it's not stopped to environmental lawyers who were effective at their work. Well, it's encouraging to hear that you're going to fight for your license back. Um, okay, I have one more question for you from the audience, which I think is dovetails nicely from that, which is, what is next for you? What happens after April? Are, are you going to write a book for us from your journal? What, what can we expect from Stephen Donziger? <laughs> well, I'm really looking forward to the future. I mean, I, I you know, well, actually, I mean, I am living the future, even though I'm in house arrest. I don't want to say I'm looking. It's like it's going to happen in the future. The future will happen in the future. And the present is the future. And I'm just, I'm happy. Um, so yes, I plan to write a book um, and do some other things to get the word out and continue to play, you know, probably more of a minor role in helping the people of Ecuador. There's other lawyers who are stepping up. You know, I've been working on this for 28 years and I will continue to be involved, but other lawyers will be taking leadership roles in terms of the enforcement of the judgment. And, um, you know, I just have a lot of opportunity. I want to start a podcast on the intersection of climate and human rights and law. Uh, and I have just a lot of plans and, um, you know, including continuing to be a human rights advocate, but across different and multiple platforms. I mean, I, through this whole experience, I've just learned so much about how we can get our voices out. I mean, you know, at Amnesty, you guys, this is probably in your DNA because of what you do, but for us non-digital natives, like you have to kind of relearn how to do some of this stuff. And I'm just really excited. And I continue, I plan to continue to be a voice on this and other issues, other human rights issues. Well, Stephen Donziger, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. We are so glad that you are home with your family. Uh, we will continue to fight for your liberation, fight against this arbitrary detention. We are with you all the way. Um, folks, check out freedonziger.com. If you look up Amnesty Stephen Donziger, you can find many different ways to reach out to the Department of Justice. Uh, we encourage folks in their communities to take action, whether you're in the U.S. or Canada or any other country. Uh, you can reach out to U.S. embassies and lodge your inquiry with them. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do to hashtag free Donziger. Um, so thank you everyone for joining today. It's been a pleasure, Stephen. And thank you, Andrew, for co-hosting with me. Uh, until next time, have can a great I, day. Can I, can I say one more thing? I just want to mention yes. that on April 25th, when my sentence ends, we're planning a celebration, we'll, details to come, um, which will involve a recognition that without amnesty and global witness and Amazon watch and the thousands of people around the world who've stepped up. I mean, do you know 90,000 people have like are on my email list? I mean, it's just insane. I could not have done this. So I want to thank each of you um, on this call and beyond who have cared because again, this goes way beyond me. It goes about values. We all really care about as human rights um, you know, human rights advocates 
and just as citizens who want to live in a free and democratic society. So I thank you. And I derive so much um, good feelings from these types of interactions. They, they lift me. And that's sort of how I'm able, getting back to Andrew's initial question, <laughs> survive almost three years of house arrest. So thanks to everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stephen. And we look forward to seeing you on more events with Amnesty branches around the world that we'll be hosting in the coming months. Uh, you have all of our solidarity and support from every corner of the earth. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Daniel Jaloy, too, at Amnesty for helping me so much. I know <laughs> this been. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attending, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.